Hello, everyone. Yay. Welcome, welcome, welcome. A huge warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Christine Kwan. I'm president of Creative Capital, and we are so excited today for our panel discussion um, and our artist project screening. So we are um, all very excited to hear from the terrific speakers that we have today. I am um, pinching myself that I was able to get James Seamus, Lorraine O'Grady, and Nick Yatujusu in one room. Um, I had to reserve this uh, over a year in advance. So. You all are very fortunate. Um, we are gonna be recording the audio of this conversation, which will be um, available after um, this event. And so you're the first to hear this conversation. Um, I know none of the speakers today need an introduction, but I have a very brief few words for each speaker. Um, I will start with James Seamus, Creative Capital National Advisory Council member. Um, he is an American screenwriter, producer, business executive, film historian, professor, and director. He is the co-founder and former CEO of Focus Features. He is the president of the production company Symbolic Exchange and professor at Columbia University. James is going to correct me if I get anything wrong. His work includes The Ice Storm, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and Brokeback Mountain. He is currently working on Andrew Ahn's reboot of Ang Lee's The Wedding Banquet, starring Bowen Yang, Lily Gladstone, and Joan Chang. Seamus served last year on the negotiating committee of the Writers Guild of America during their successful five-month strike. And Lorraine O'Grady, 2015 Creative Capital Awardee, is an American artist, writer, translator, and critic. Working in conceptual art and performance art, she explores the cultural construction of identity, particularly that of black female subjectivity as shaped by the experiences of diaspora and hybridity. O'Grady uses the diptychs both and thinking to frame her themes as symptoms of a larger problematic, that of the divisive and hierarchical either or categories underpinning Western philosophy. O'Grady studied at Wellesley College and the University of Iowa Writers' Workshop. O'Grady has worked as an intelligence analyst for the U.S. Department of Labor and State and a rock critic. So she does it all. Um, and her paper archive is in the collection of the Wellesley College Library and her artworks are in the collections of the Art Institute of Chicago, Carnegie Museum of Art, LACMA, MoMA, Tate Modern, Walker Art Center, Whitney Museum, and many, many others around the globe. And last but not least, Nick Yatu Juice. Oh, let me. Yeah. And last but not least, Nikyatu Jusu, 2022 Creative Capital Awardee, is a Sierra Leonean American filmmaker. Her first feature film, Nanny, a Creative Capital supported project, debuted at the 2022 Sundance Film Festival, where it won the Grand Jury Prize. <laughs> Professor Jusu is the second black woman director, and Nanny is the first horror film to be so honored. Jusu earned her MFA in film production from the Tisch Graduate Film Program at NYU, where she was awarded the Spike Lee Fellowship and the Princess Grace Narrative Film Grant. She has a BA from Duke University in Literature and Film. So please give a warm applause to all of our speakers today. Please come to the stage. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm uh, so honored to be designated as a kind of moderator for today's discussion. We've got a half an hour to discuss between us, and um, and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion for, uh, with all of you uh, for another 15 minutes. Um, so let's take it away. I'll just dive right in. Uh, and uh, notice that uh, I did not supply that photo, by the way. Whatever I was thinking was not a <laughs> radical idea, clearly. Uh, but yeah, so it's great. Uh, the New York Times, which we all know, whatever. Um, I want to start, Nikatu, with a question. Uh, we're in a really particularly fraught moment in general for the arts, and 
the relation of artists and the institutions that uh, circulate and support them, that work and support them. Uh, uh, and I know we'll touch briefly, I'm sure, on uh, your recent experience at, at Tribeca. Yes, um, right. But I want to go back to, to Nanny just for a sec, because mm -hmm. the film is so uh, literally and figuratively uh, haunting. Um, and, and talk about something I, I, I clocked in particular when I first saw it, and that was the role of fine art uh, mm -hmm. as both commodity decoration uh, object, but also a signifier on so many different levels within the film. And there's in, uh, a, a really important number, in fact, of, of artists and artworks that feature in the film and in the built environment, uh, designed environment um, uh, that Aisha enters into. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit about uh, your thoughts, looking now back at, at Nanny, and the depiction and use of, of art, how, how you mobilized and thought about that depiction in the film. I have a lot of respect for every medium of art. And I think that also straddling academia as a professor, you know this all too well. It's like, how do we encourage our students to not just continuously pay hom homage to filmmakers they love, but like create their own signature within cinema. And I think one of the best ways to create your own, sprinkle your DNA into this canon in a unique way is to understand that your influences come from different mediums. Um, I'm just so honored to be on this panel with Lorraine O'Grady. <laughs> like, <laughs> Lorraine is one of my big <laughs> inspirations since like undergrad, before I even really grasped that maybe I needed to pursue being an artist and not an engineer. Um, so I think that it makes you a fuller artist to venture into other mediums and understand the ways that they inform your own work. So Wangechi Mutu's work was featured heavily in Nanny. And that was a process of like convincing someone who creates fine art to participate in what seems like Hollywood, but not quite, because I'm broke. <laughs> and I'm still an indie filmmaker who has a tiny budget, but still wants to feature artists who I revere, who I respect, who have a major canon that I, I, I just want, always want to feature artists who are historically marginalized in other mediums within my filmmaking. That's just something that I want to do, and I think it enhances my artistry to look to artists like Lorraine and other visual artists. Thank you. Um, over to you, Lorraine, and I should uh, uh, confess, um, uh, I approach Lorraine it, it, with extraordinary pedantry. I actually teach uh, her work in my graduate seminars. Uh, and her writing, her, her, her as an activist, thinker, writer, critical maker, um, as the last, the, the last uh, piece of our seminars. And, and Lorraine, I've gotten to know Lorraine because she's been gracing our, our seminar for our last uh, meetings the last few years. So, um, but I, I want to talk about this, this question of art inside art. Mm -hmm. And um, here we are in a room of, of artists who are crossing and networking and uh, grantying and granting, right? Um, how do you uh, figure in your work? Because especially I'm going back now to Mademoiselle uh, Bourgeoisement, right? Um, where uh, the presence of your art in the spaces where art is housed uh, and, um, and proffered uh, seems to have a lot of things going on. Let's put it that way. Yeah, a lot of things, a lot of things going on is the big secret to the whole thing, right? Um, <laughs> and there are always a lot of things going on, and from piece to piece there are a lot of different things going on. So, um, in something like Mademoiselle Bouchon's Noir, the, um, the comparison between the aesthetic and, and the political was pretty direct and the interplay between the two was pretty direct. Uh, but I think that um, in general, uh, uh, the question of the aesthetic is a complicated one because it means different things in different bodies of work. It means different things at different moments in history. It means different things um, in, uh, depending upon whether one is thinking about ideology or methodology, okay? And, um, uh, so, 
Uh, sometimes I th I'm thinking about the aesthetic as the oppositional term to politics, as in Mademoiselle Bourgeois Noir, and sometimes I am thinking about it as um, the, uh, uh, the, the opposite term can be uh, physics, <laughs> you know. But, the, but, in the, but between physics and, and, and the opposition becomes more interesting, the more similar the two terms become. So that in the case of, uh, it, it, I don't find the opposition between aesthetics and politics that interesting. So I don't want to use it very much. It's certainly not anymore. I've already done with that. And, um, uh, but the opposition between uh, is that the aesthetic and the factoid, <laughs> or, the, or the, f the physical sciences, normally thinking, or the biological sciences, that can become very interesting because most conversations between artists and physicists begin and end with the idea that they both get their ideas in the same way. <laughs> they, bo they both get their ideas usually through dreams. Uh, the uh, the uh, that that's that's similar, but it's not quite as active in the current moment as an opposition. Mm. However, there's another opposition that I think of as extremely problematic uh, for the aesthetic, and I think it may be uh, more accurate of today's situation. And I think that uh, the problem uh, of the relationship between the aesthetic and the religious is the most difficult uh, one, and the one that is the most operative in the commodification of the aesthetic. That, that, in, that the fact that art has replaced God in a lot of people's minds and lives is the thing that is creating the difference in the relationship of the aesthetics well, not the difference, but the, but the way in which the aesthetic becomes commodified. That, in the, that okay, to backtrack a little bit, um, there is a, a I was gonna ask you to do that, so huh? thank you, yeah, yeah. Backtrack a little bit, yeah. Yeah, back up. So, so for instance, uh, the reason I say it's not as, it, it, to me, the, the, the opposition between the aesthetic and, pop, the, and the political is not as interesting as, say, the opposition between the, the political and the philosophic. Okay, that in the, with the political, you have, um, you have a class of, of uh, workers who are most interested in giving others what they want. In the philosophic, you have a class of workers who are more interested in calling people to what they need. So, it's, so, so, po so politics plays the role of, 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 uh, of basically placating what people want and, uh, and philosophy plays the role of reminding people what they need. Mm. That's a very platonic uh, vibe. Okay. Uh, you know, Plato, and by the way, we should remind ourselves, Plato did banish the poets, so all of you in that category, yeah. out of here. Um, uh, we're talking about, what's interesting is, you're using the word uh, opposition, uh, but you're also, um, as Christine pointed out in her introduction, um, you've, de you, you, you've decomposed, if not deconstructed, through an and or vision of these oppositions, a notion of functionality. A notion of hybridity and, and through, through concepts and, and interrogations of concepts like, mm -hmm. such as miscegenation and elsewhere. So um, I find that uh, uh, that while politics and aesthetic may be the least interesting of the oppositions for you right now, they're very present, I think, in the room still for all, for all of us, even for you, I think. And I think that there's a sense in which uh, as you pointed out, there's a genealogy to what, what, what art is and what the aesthetic is. It, it's constantly changing. And these two, two, two terms are functions of each other, that the aesthetic actually creates mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a space for politics, but politics creates a space for what we think of as art, which is still a pretty recent 
concept. It's still a pr pretty recent experience for people really in the West since the 18th century when aesthetics was created, right? You know, art with a capital A. James, I just want to clarify, I am not uh, saying that the, um, that the opposition between the aesthetic and the political has no interest even yes. today. It, it's still a very great current interest in yeah. exactly the way that you're describing yes. it. I'm just saying that I have exhausted my interest in it with the, <laughs> with, with, with the You've Mademoiselle. You've done great, so, with, you've with done the great service. With the Mademoiselle Bush was our trilogy, right? You know, yes. I, did the, I did the piece that, that was as political as I could possibly get, which was Mademoiselle Bush shouting out these poems that say what the problem is, and then having to say that, well, shouting out poems isn't going to get you anywhere, and so do, curating a show called The Black and white show where I say this is who these are who the artists should be, and then that, then then saying okay, maybe they get it, maybe they don't. Go with the Harlem and saying this is who the audience should be. So answering three different political questions, I answered them as well as I could, and so I, at, at, and it wasn't really my biggest interest because my biggest interest always has been about explaining things to me, not to them. You know, understand. <laughs> Well put. Um, thank you. Yeah. I'm going to return then to this, to this again, opposition slash function to, to Nanny. Um, and and I, 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 again, and, and uh, Nikati, what you said was so crucial, that sense of the presence of other art and other artists. And it's lifting up. And it really, the imprecation of your entire vision through this world um, uh, uh, of so many references. On the other hand, they were many of those references were hanging on the wall of this uh, really super creepy white liberal couple who had the money to purchase these objects, at least in the story world, mm -hmm. uh, and to present them as some kind of function of their own identity, as curators or as as, as cultured people, as people who appreciate and love the arts, right? Yeah. Um, and how how did that? How did you manage that? in the process of making the film and, and thinking it through? You know, I, I, I still wanted practically to pay black and brown artists for the art that I featured in my film, even though I was showcasing a family that utilized that art, for, you know, to, to be perceived as people who were worldly and understood what it means to be minoritized. Um, so the photojournalist imagery that you see in the protagonist Hus no, not the protagonist, the husband of the wife that is, whose child is being taken care of, that is real art from women of color. Um, and yet photojournalistic ventures are very, I made that his career for a reason. He's a photo photojournalist, white man in uh, communities that are, you know, being imperialized and con colonized and, genocide is prevalent in these nations, and it all speaks back to a certain period of these nations' creation. Um, so it's commentary on utilizing black and brown suffering as a means to showcase how tapped in you are to minoritized communities. Um, so I, I use other mediums to make micro-commentary within the work, and I think that Art can be used as a weapon. It can be used as a unifying factor. It can be used as so many things, especially in this climate as we transition into what looks like the new chapter of motion picture, specifically. Um, yeah. Yeah, which, which goes to the, if we're looking for a radical idea for the morning or the afternoon, early afternoon, um, th it raises the question as to whether or not art itself is kind of not a good thing right now. Yeah, I mean, I always think art is a good thing. Uh, if it's I art. I don't, but that's okay. We'll get <laughs> it, that uh, if it's art, if it's truly art, and maybe we have to define what we mean by art, you know? I think it starts from the definition of what you're calling art. And a lot of people are pumping out things that are divisive, that are promoting a certain agenda, and that's the inception of Hollywood. Like, let's be real. Saidia Hartman commented on this, that it's a big PR machine for certain agendas. So I'm aware of what I'm navigating, I'm aware of what I'm being ushered into, and I'm constantly figuring out, as someone who wants to actually make a living as a single woman in this world, a single black woman in this world, 
who feels very unprotected within the capitalistic paradigm, I'm always going to figure out, because I'm too deep in <laughs> to making films to turn back now, unfortunately. So I'm like, how can I protect myself but still make a living? Which is why academia feels like such a safe space for me, um, because I get to teach my craft and kind of have control over the ways that I make money. Uh, I can say no a lot. I, I'm kind of branching off into something else, but it all speaks to what gets to be defined as art, what does it mean to be a working artist in this current paradigm? Those are all things that I'm constantly thinking about and I'm always going to advocate for myself because no one else is gonna advocate for you as aggressively as you can advocate for yourself. I think when I said, uh, uh, provo provoked the phrase, uh, I don't, um, uh, what I mean, what I meant was something just sitting between you two really and looking out here at the sea of faces, um, the conundrum that we're facing, I think collectively right now, which is a sense that um, just like uh, the artworks that appear on the walls in your film, I'll go back, I'm not gonna stop with the film, don't worry. <laughs> um, uh, there is a sense of dispossession also in, in the, that, that occurs through the creation and the, uh, the kind of giving into the world uh, of, of work right, right now. And that the structure of the aesthetic as it's happening now um, is accelerating, I think, some of that sense of dispossession, some of that sense of, of loss of control, of, of interpretive, and uh, you know, the sense of what you might say ownership, but I think yeah. that's already a, a, a has its own uh, overtones, right? You, you wanna? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, maybe uh, sort of put a little bit more nuance into the term, uh, opposition term. <laughs> uh, I think that um, uh, what can sometimes be think be thought of as an opposition may uh, sometimes be more fruitfully thought of as the obverse and reverse of the mm -hmm. same coin, right? And um, and I have this I have this discussion I'm having this discussion um, in a way with a very close friend of mine in the art world, as many of you may know, S Simone Lee, and. Um, We've known each other for quite some time now, and um, and it's become clear that um, that we are doing the same thing in different ways, and that the difference between um, uh, Simone's thinking and my thinking is that um, she is more epistemologically involved in terms of thinking about uh, systems of African knowledge that can be, that are still ap applicable. Uh, and I am more thinking about, uh, thinking ontologically and uh, more about, uh, less thinking about recovering Africa than I am about understanding what we created after we got here. Which is much more to me an ontological, what do you do, who are you when you are in a situation like the one that was created in the Western Hemisphere. And, um, and so sometimes, sometimes uh, I think that I'm being more successful than she is, and sometimes I think she's being more successful than I am. Do you understand? No, not successful in the, in the world's terms, but in our own terms, what we're both trying to accomplish, and, um, and what needs to be accomplished. I mean, obviously, uh, the African diaspora is as complicated as anything that ever happened in the world. And uh, it, it, it requires both an ontological and an epistemological point approach to understand it fully. So I think that, um, I don't think that anybody needs to feel that they need to be doing anything in any particular way. I think it really is a matter of who you are, how you intersect with the, with the world, what kind of work you think you can do most effectively. It's, that's about where it is, it's, it's about all you can do. do yeah. and, and to that point, of course, part of the inter, intercept, interception, let's say, of your, uh, uh, of your career, your trajectory, was as a, yourself a, a, a Creative Capital uh, awardee, right? Um, 
And it's since we're here today and we're, we're with a lot of folks who are, who've now been anointed and granted, as you two have, can you talk a little bit about the way in which that, um, that moment and that community inflected any of your work or what happened since? Well, listen, I just had a conversation with uh, Leslie Singer, okay? <laughs> Leslie, are you still here? <laughs> um, uh, um, I got my award in 2015 and I got my award before, before I actually uh, had a chance to think my ideas through. And so, while I was thinking... It's not, not really a believable statement, but... Yeah. No. Well, no, 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 they're always, you're always thinking them through. You're always thinking them through, right? You know? um, and, um, and so, for some reason, I, des I decided that I needed to start with this incredibly expensive um, forging of a suit of plated arm, plated seal armor, okay? And, and I felt that somehow I needed to make it out of the, whatever, whatever money I was making from art with my gallery, that's what I would have to use for this very expensive project. And the creative capital uh, uh, money would have to go for refinement and promotion and things like that. So I didn't draw down my money all the way from creative capital. And as a matter of fact, I had to, today, Leslie's handing me a check for something else, and I say, oh, you know, I think you, I think you still owe me $20,000. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, Leslie said, sue me. So, yeah. so, 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 I'm gonna have, so I'm gonna have to go back now and, you know, and, and make my justification for my next $20,000, right? But, or my final $20,000. So it can take a long time bef between the time when you, when all the aspects of, a project can be so big that, it's that it's uh, ex the execution of the art, and then the promotion of the art, and then and then all of the ways in which all of these things continue to interact with the world in different ways over time. All of this can become so complicated that the business of financing and support can take different shapes and different forms. It's so interesting that the, the as you describe it, um, the grant really was in some ways uh, you could describe it as exterior to the materiality of the project, but yes. in fact it was imbricated and completely part of it, yeah. but just untheorized by a lot of the rest of the, uh, the art, art world and the yeah. support set system, so that's yeah. great. Yeah, Mikatu, how about you? <laughs> <laughs> I love, listen, I'm here for a reason. Creative Capital has been really good to me, and they were the first money in to Nanny. They were the first money in to my first feature before I was exposed to financiers and before I was exposed to thinking about my first feature as a product, um, which was a process because we love, if you're lucky, you get to make your first feature on your own terms. And I, I got that because of in creative capital, Sundance, Tribeca, like indie institutions were the first money in and they allowed me to have financing for proof of concept, for development art, because I want to work in fantasy. And we all know that VFX and fantasy um, elements are very expensive. And a lot of filmmakers who want to imagine themselves out of struggle, who want to navigate fantasy and imagine a future, a different future, are shut out of fantasy. It's not necessarily in a it is an agenda to some degree, but also it's an expensive genre to make, just practically speaking. If you're a writer, director, or a director, or a filmmaker who wants to work in fantasy, you need more money than the average drama. You need more money than the average rom-com. And so what Creative Capital allowed me to do with Nanny is, and with my producer, Nikia Moteri, who was very pivotal in the process of making Nanny, is seek out a conceptual artist to design my mermaid, is to design on the page in a low stakes way, you know, some of the VFX practical effects, because I love practical effects that I would have in my first feature. And the more you plan the glacier beneath the water, the easier it is to make a really low budget uh, feature with high production value on the screen. 
all that prep before you actually hit day one of shooting is what cap creative capital allowed me to pay for. Um, and so it was really pivotal as the first money in. Well, we are moving into the second part of our program, which is <laughs> you guys. Um, I don't know if there's a microphone in the audience, uh, somebody with a microphone wandering the audience, or do you, are, will you just be shouting loudly? <laughs> I will repeat the question. So hands up, and, um, and we'll, we'll take it from there. Yes, right there. Yes, uh, if you could shout even for me, who will repeat. So how do you how do you Excuse reconcile? Me, I'm hard of hearing. I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it. I'll okay. repeat it. Um, how do you reconcile uh, your responsibility as an artist to an audience to open up their minds with your personal passion? to do, I, I assume, I mean, my, I'm translating the question, whatever the fuck you want to do. Okay, good, yeah, sorry if that, that just makes it louder when you throw in a swear word. Um, yeah, so, so uh, and the, the assumption in that uh, question obviously is the, is the one in the first part of it. Well, actually, there are two, two assumptions. Uh, one is that there is a responsibility to the audience, yeah. and the second one is that you actually are doing whatever it is you really want to do. And both of those assumptions, I think, are, are really interesting, you know, compelling assumptions, and both can be pushed back on uh, as we describe the current state of what we think of as art and, its, and the structures that support it, right? I, I think of, um, you know, uh, 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 especially the last couple hundred years, you know, since the aesthetic came into being in the, in the midst of the, of the rise of global capitalism, which itself rose on the backs of things like the Atlantic slave trade, right, racialized capitalism, and more and more, I'm seeing a mutation myself now uh, in that system where you know, it, it's ever more clear to me uh, that the production of art is, is, is actually the production of art's patronage of a kind of culture, right? Uh, which, by the way, is not a bad th For the patrons here, please don't think that's a bad thing. <laughs> it's a great, it's fantastic. But in a sense, you're producing them, right? Uh, and creative capital has a, is a very specific matrix that really negotiates this stuff, I think, with a lot of finesse. Um, but th then you see your two assumptions start to get inflected, and I'll stop talking now and see if anybody else wants to answer that question. You, you ca I love that you started with like questioning the question, because uh, do artists actually take on, what does it mean to be a, an artist in the United States? Let's, let's be super specific. What does it mean to be an artist in the United States who is navigating a system that is not necessarily conducive to positive imagery for your community? Like that, that's the reality of what a lot of artists are navigating. And so it's like, how many no's do you give to an industry that you want to survive on um, before you say, I have to figure out how to make my own thing again, you know, again and again and again. There's no catching a stride with Hollywood. I think that's really important for people to understand. And uh, most of you, I th I'm gonna assume, don't necessarily want to be a part of Hollywood, um, but I will assume that people want to make a living off of their craft and their art uh, because it's a privilege to be able to create, especially in this climate. And it's a, it's a responsibility for the few who are representing communities that are not necessarily represented in the mainstream. So it's riddled with conflict, but I think at the end of the day, you have to figure out what success looks like to you. Are you making pieces that will be in a museum and really challenge people's perceptions of what it means to be human? Are you, or are you aiming to make an action sci-fi horror at the 60 million budget level and maybe not recoup that budget? Because a lot of films are not recouping budgets and the industry is actively rejecting the reality of where we are. So they're judging filmmakers based on box office when that is an archaic model. So there are a lot of questions that are micro questions that arise from your larger questions, but I think ultimately you have to figure out 
as a creator, I won't even say an artist, as a creator, what does success look like for you? I, I just, <clears throat> just want to say that um, obviously, uh, for somebody like me, who had no role models at all, and was by default uh, sort of having to become their own role model, uh, that, you know, I certainly wish that I were entering the art world now when I didn't have to sort of like do all of this by myself. Uh, so I can only uh, address that question in retrospect and say that um, uh, what I've discovered is that uh, the question of uh, what the audience uh, needs or wants and what the individual artist needs or wants uh, have a curious way of intersecting, and they intersect at the level of uh, honesty somehow, and that if one is working with one's own material and one's own desires as an artist, honestly and desperately, but perhaps because there's always this desperation, that somehow or the other, one hits some bedrock that has the ability to reach others over time. Maybe not within the first five years, but certainly within the first 25 years. And um, it, that's a mysterious process. How does, how does it go from the, from the inside of the artist to the inside of the community or the inside of the world in general. I don't think, I, listen, when I was a, a rock critic, I uh, met a guy who, who was, uh, he, he was, he was the, um, he was the Jew with the two Turks, the, t the two Muslims who owned Atlantic Records, right? And, um, and I remember him stopping me in mid-sentence, and he said, Lorraine, the chemistry of a hit is something that man knoweth not. <laughs> exactly. Back to the epistemological issue. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. This question or thought. Hand up right there. Right there. Oh, you have a mic. All right. Oh, oh goodness. Um, yeah, I was thinking about what, um, Lorraine, you had said about how art um, has become God, and I, I, kind of, I really agree in how that incentivizes commodification. So um, that's like the art market, right? And there's a, a power to the art market and the circulation of aesthetic and image because it's sort of like a lot more, um, uh, like it lasts longer than an aesthetic that can end or a vision or image that can come to an end. So I'm wondering when that happens, when the art becomes God, does it take or becomes the circulation? Does it take, how does, what does it mean for the power to get take? does it get taken away from the art or does it get transformed? Like what happens to the power of art? So I'm gonna uh, say the following, since we have about eight more minutes, so we're gonna limit responses on uh, questions going forward to like one minute per, which is like your question. I'm gonna nerd out here. I was just listening yesterday in the car, driving down here to J.M. Bernstein's 2006 seminar on Hegel's early theology, which is literally about the way, uh, you know what, I'm gonna stop right there. Lorraine. No, I don't have, I, 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 don't even, I don't even know that I can capture the question, let alone the answer in one minute, so why don't you go ahead. Well, no, no, no. Uh, then take two. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 yeah, just even a response to the... Well, well what, what exactly is the question? Yeah, yeah. that's a good question. Yeah, I think... <laughs> I, uh, yeah, you, you, you go, but I have a thought about it, but go ahead. Oh, what happens to the power of the art when um, it turns into a com commodification, when that takes, you know, does it get taken away? I'll answer. It actually gets the power. The, 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 uh, I think the, the theological move is actually the commodification move. It's the fetish move. It's that, you know, as Marx talks about in volume one of Capital. That's what I was saying, that, the, uh, yeah. that re the relationship is really between art and religion here. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's that it, uh, suddenly the object appears as a fetishized special being, so to speak, disengaged from the conditions, the social relations that created it. And in a weird way, the aesthetic is that. It's like that mysterious, beautiful, perfect thing that emitted somehow magically from the power of an individual image. But in fact, that aura is itself an erasure 
of the conditions in terms of the social relations that created even its possibility. So, you know, Adorno has that wonderful moment, right, when he talks about uh, art is uh, the exact opposite of the useful, right? You know, use value. Every, you know, the hammer is useful. This is useful. Art is the is the absolutely not useful. That's why it's art. And then he pauses in his essay and goes, "Of course, what's the use of the useless? What's the value of the valueless?" Right. So art is that magic trick. That th theological move, I think, is kind of what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. and they only charge sixty thousand a year for uh, tuition at Columbia, so you can get this any day <laughs> up there. Uh, yeah. Next, next question or thought. A moment of silence. Can, well, can yeah. I can, Please, can I absolutely. say something that I uh, uh, I have had on my mind since we started this, and that was that um, uh, the basic thing is uh, Flannery O'Connor, who, um, as many of you may know, was a white Catholic writer who was always writing from a Catholic point of view, but, but had grown up in the South and only knew Protestants, uh, Protestants right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and she realized at a certain point that the artists can choose what they want to write about. But she said, they cannot choose what they can make live. So she had to use the people that she knew, the language that she knew, which was the language of a, of a theological world was diametrically opposed to her own, to somehow convert that into meaning for her own culture, uh, or, or to explain the meaning of her own culture to it. And, um, and I think that that statement, that the artists can choose what they want to work on, but they can't choose what they can make live. And so every artist is ultimately faced with the resources that they have within themselves in order to make art that can move others. And, um, and it's not necessarily a choice that is uh, something that we can actually choose. It's something that's forced upon us by the reality of our lives and our talents and our dispositions, psychological dispositions. And so th the important thing is to recognize what one's limits are, what one's, uh, 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 what one's possibilities are, and to be truthful to those and to exploit them as best one can and be damned with the theory that's floating around out there, you know? <laughs> I agree. I, I, both of these wise people have said, I'm learning as I'm on this panel and you know, to broach the elephant in the room, which is the looming conversation and the present conversation around AI. It's like, who owns what? What is art? This is a current, very tangible and ubiquitous conversation that needs to be had. Um, I think that once you create something, whether we're talking about the current navigation of AI or we're talking about literal, you know, live action filmmaking as it stands right now, it belongs to the audience once you create it. You, you're not in the room to defend your choices anymore. You, you have your intention and you hope that your intention lives in different rooms, but I think that once you create something, especially in this climate, because we can't, I would be remiss to not mention this transitionary period of the industry. Like it's a really, we're all feeling it, it's visceral, um, people are frustrated, people are angry, people are fearful, and all of it is justifiable. Like, I don't know what the next iteration of filmmaking is going to look like in this climate, but I do know that all we can control is what we create and how we create it, and as much of your voice as you can imbue into your first major project will establish what kind of projects you are being presented with in the future. So it's really important to be specific about your first entry point. And I feel like Lorraine asked me a really interesting, do you mind if I share this, Lorraine, about the nanny? What? About my film, Nanny, like being part of the canon of nannies. I'm, I'm asking like in front of an audience if I can share uh, it. You, you said something. Uh, but it, it's a question I've gotten a lot about I'll how. Fire away. I, I've gotten this question a lot about like, you know, you made another nanny film. You made another film where black women are the help and how are you changing the can? That wasn't exactly your question, so mm -hmm. I'm not misquoting. 
Lorraine, but she was curious about how I feel about having a nanny film be my breakout film. Um, and it, it's, you can't control the, the, the narrative of your trajectory. You can only control it to a certain degree. I had other ideas. I still have my vampire, my vampire idea has been the idea mm -hmm. that I wanted to be my first feature. However, the reality is that I'm at the mercy of a system that is really specific about the kinds of stories it wants to see with black women leads. And so art, yes, we can talk about this theoretically and academically and we can use all the academic jargon, but it, you, we would be remiss to not acknowledge the system that we're all navigating and what is funded and how it's funded. Yeah. And, and with that, let's end on a positive note, which is part of that system is what brought us all together yes. here and the kind of uh, modeling, the peer review and the support laterally, horizontally, as well as vertically um, that is represented in this room and the help that you're giving all of us and that you'll give each other is something we'll be taking away for a long time. That's really part of the experience of, of, of what this institution and the people it brings together represents. So thank you so much. That's our time. I think there's a 15 minute break. Is that yeah. right? Thank you so much. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you, Nikata. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.